Business leader Mike Arnold was at the 2010 Willow Creek Global Leadership Summit. While he was there, he heard business leaders talk about impacting the world with compassion and justice through their businesses. Mike realized that God had placed him into the business world in part to do good, in great part, even through the normal part of the workings of his business, but then through special efforts to do good in the world. And so an idea began to generate in his mind where Walgreens could be involved in providing vital health care with some of the poorest people in the world and some of the most vulnerable children in the world. He went back from the summit with a new fire inside of him. He worked on the idea. He presented it to his boss, an idea about Walgreens using some of their profits to then subsidize giving vaccines in other parts of the world. His thought was it would make a great impact on the world and be great PR as well. His boss thought the idea was a great idea. But there was no money to do it. End of story. Mike got a chance to share this idea with other people at work, and always the response was the same. Man, what a terrific idea. There's no money. One day he found himself in the elevator with the CEO. You've heard about having to practice your elevator speech? Well, here it was. He had 30 seconds with the CEO. He didn't want to say anything, but he felt the Holy Spirit prompting him, and so finally he blurted out, I've got an idea of a way that Walgreens can make a difference in the rest of the world. Can I share it with you? He found himself soon afterwards with 30 minutes to pitch his idea to the CEO. The CEO loved the idea, and of course there's money to do this. He got authorization to talk with anybody in the corporation necessary to make it happen. And the result was the give a shot, a get a shot, give a shot campaign. It's been incredibly accessible. The three million people you saw there, that was a year ago. And they're running one more year of it. So who knows how many people will be impacted. We just saw the results of it. Because Mike acted, acted on a prompting from God millions of children have received lifelong, life-giving vaccines. We're in the middle of, we're in uh, another week on our series called Custom Made. And we started by talking about how we're fearfully and wonderfully made by, by God. Each one of us uh, valuable in God's sight. Then we talked about how we're uniquely made and we have differences and those differences contribute to our life together then we saw that it's not just about what we do and what gifts we have, but that character is the most important thing that God is working out in our lives. And then last week, we took a look at the fact that it's the local church is here to equip us to serve more effectively and to use our gifts better. And today, we're going to take a look at the fact that we are given as a gift to the world. It's too easy to see spiritual gifts and God's work in our life as something that God is doing for the sake of the local church. It is for the sake of the local church. But then we go out into the workplace, into the community, and we think that it's a whole different set of rules. There's the spiritual life, and then there's the rest of life. And God's special gifts to us are for churchy things. And the rest of our life just gets our talents and our training. The mistake about this is it makes God too small. The God of churchy things is the God of everything. And the life of Daniel shows us that. Today we're going to go into the first chapter of the book of Daniel, and we're going to see that God sent Daniel beyond the church. 
And we're going to learn from it how we are sent beyond the church to be a gift in the nitty-gritty world around us. And so I'd like to pray, and then we'll take a look at Daniel 1. Let's pray. God, thank you for these gifts of being able to gather to hear your word, to be able to understand, to be able to talk together, for the gift of being able to believe. And so, God, now work in our hearts through your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That's why you go to seminary, so you can pronounce words like that. <laughs> Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar. It's not that we pronounce it right, but we pronounce it forcefully and with confidence. Okay. <laughs> and then the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing an aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king then would have my head because of you. Then Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine and that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's get a little background on Daniel. Background starts with 2 Kings. 2 Kings tells us about the last days of Israel before Babylon takes over. It ends with the king of Judah in Babylon living out his days as a prisoner of the king of Babylon, and that's about 586 B.C. For years before that, God's people had drifted farther and farther from him. The prophets came and warned them, if you don't change, I'm going to send people to judge you. They didn't change and God did send judgment. 
And the enemy that was at the gates was the latest, greatest empire, the empire of Babylon. The Babylonians were cruel and brutal. They were hated. Emotionally, they were in about the same place in the hearts of Israelites as ISIS and the Taliban would be for us. The Babylonians would take over a nation violently. Then they would skim off the most promising youth. Then they would send everybody who remained alive into exile, deporting most of the population, knowing that people who are in exile, who are not in their home country, those people are easier to govern. And so the book of Daniel begins in Babylon. And Daniel is one of these young people. It has the distinction of being uh, the only book in the Bible to have been written partially in Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of the Chaldeans, the people who were in control of Babylon. And it also happens to be the language of Jesus. This title character, Daniel, is one of the most promising among the young refugees. And he's recruited for service. He's in exile. He's a refugee. While he's there, his name is changed. And his name is changed to Belteshazzar, which is related to the name of one of the Babylonian gods. He has to learn a new language. Every day as he gets educated and as he climbs the rank of government, every day he's aware of the fact that he's a refugee. This is not home. His goals are not synonymous with the king's goals because God had set Israel on a journey and God had shaped values within the life of of Israel that become more and more different than the goals of the communities around them. And there Daniel is. He serves Gentile kings for his entire life. The chapter ends by saying he stays until King Cyrus. And he is considered one of the most righteous people in the entire Old Testament. Every day, I'm guessing that he had to make choices about what it meant to live in this tension of being God's person and yet working within this environment. Should he just blend in and climb as high and as far as possible? Should he stick out like a sore thumb, always goading people to do something differently? Should he do what he can to get out of this and move out into the suburbs, away from it all? Each day, he had to navigate, what does it mean to be faithful to God, but serving in this world? And that's a question I think you and I face all the time. What does it mean to be faithful to God and yet serving in this world? There are four lessons in the book of Daniel I'd like us to take a look at this morning that will help us learn more about what it means to navigate this tension of being a blessing in this world. And so the first lesson that's here is that we have to have a sense of identity. A sense of identity that's rooted in something deeper than the job and the income. An identity that's rooted in God. There's no evidence in the first chapter of Daniel that Daniel and his friends felt like they, as worshipers of the God of the Bible, that they felt like it it was necessary for them to escape serving this king. There's no evidence of that. But what we do see in the first chapter is that Daniel is bothered about something, about eating the king's food. From our vantage point, we don't know exactly what's wrong with the king's food as we look back at it. Because as Jews, they they weren't called to be vegetarians. There was no problem with eating meat. There was no problem with wine. 
There wasn't, as far as we can tell from the details that are given here, anything in the Jewish law that would explicitly keep them from eating the entire diet. Maybe when pork was offered. So what is it? For him, somehow, clearly a line had to be drawn. And the word defiled that comes up in verse 8 here might be helpful for us. He didn't want to make himself unclean. What could be behind that thought? One of the things that could be behind it is that Daniel might have known that these meats and were being offered to idols and that eating the meat would be somehow showing allegiance to these gods and participating in this honor that was given these gods. Maybe that's what's on his mind. Or maybe he realized that the, uh, the stakes in the Cabernet were coming from this terrible king and um, to eat at his table was, would be like being part of his family and showing allegiance to him and that he didn't want to do that. We don't know. But the issue does seem to be allegiance. The issue does seem to be core identity. And so Daniel resolved that to fully serve God, he could participate in the government training, he could receive an education in a career, but he draws a line here. And across his life, he had to draw a line again and again in order to remain faithful to protect his identity as a follower of the God of Israel. Daniel served a whole series of non-Jewish kings. They were brutal. They often oppressed people. And yet within this system, Daniel was a righteous man who served God. But part of what made that work was that he had a firm hold on his identity as a God follower. The lines we need to draw as a Christ follower might be different than that. One of the things we learn from Daniel is at least we don't have to say that we have to be afraid that the only way to be faithful to God is if we work for a Christian company. Daniel teaches us, no, it's not that black and white. But when the values of the kingdom stand against the values of American culture or our company or our community, what will we do? Sometimes it's fine, probably, to go with the flow. Sometimes the best thing would be to engage the culture, to try to change it. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to resist, knowing that we can't change it at the moment. But again and again, we need to remember in the midst of this tension that we are more than our job and our income. Our life is more than where we are able to live and what schools our kids are able to go to. At the core of our identity, we belong to God. The second lesson here is the lesson of integrity. Daniel had a genuine commitment to the kings that he served. You can read through the whole book of Daniel, and there's all kinds of occasions that there's conflict between Daniel's values and the values of the kingdom around him. But he never becomes a political plotter or a backstabber. He uses his influence for good. In chapter 6, verse 4, it says this about him. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. As Christians, uh, there are times that we're going to deeply feel the tension between our values and the values of the world around us, our company, our community, the school system. But when we do feel that, it's not time to go all terrorist on them. Somehow Daniel could disagree, disagree deeply enough that he was willing to die and take those consequences for that disagreement. And yet do so while he served them well 
and was respectful in his relationships. So much so that every king in this series of kings sought his counsel. Third point. Third lesson we learned is that Daniel was gifted and skilled. He was good at what he did. Little of what happens in the book of Daniel would have happened if it wasn't for the fact that the kings found him to be greatly helpful. He was promoted time after time. And what we learn here is that doing our best matters. We should get the training. We should improve our skills. We should work hard at what we do. And on top of that, God gives Daniel supernatural gifts as he serves these kings. So here, this clearly shows God's engagement in the whole of the world. It says in chapter 1 that God gave him a special capacity to interpret dreams and visions. And that happens in chapter 2 and chapter 4. On top of that, God miraculously delivers Daniel in one of the most dangerous moments of his life. So we see here that God is supernaturally involved in the politics and the community and the workplace. So that means we can pray for insight and actually expect that God cares about giving us guidance. We can pray and expect wisdom if we have a difficult relationship with the coach of the baseball team. You know, Andy and John Pusateri might, you know, be causing problems. We can seek God's protection in those moments when things get difficult and we have to take a risk. God is with us, and he's at work around us. And so what we see here, because of God's involvement, because of God vesting himself in our world, we need to be offering our best. And this is not just true in our work environment. It's about everything important that we do. We may be at home raising children. We may be caring for an aging parent. It may be studies at school. It may be something we don't want to do, like studies at school. But God is with us. And he's working around us. So let's do it well. The fourth lesson we learn from Daniel is his willingness to lose it all. Job, role, honor, personal safety were not important than obeying God. Later in Daniel's life, in chapter 6, King Darius makes a pronouncement that anyone who prays to any god or man apart from the king for 30 days should be thrown into the lion's den. Daniel hears this. Daniel doesn't run away, but he also doesn't comply. And so he worships one god only, and he does so three times a day quietly in his own home. When the king hears about this, He values Daniel so much that he makes every effort legally possible to save him. But the laws trump the will of the king. And ultimately, it's only God who can save him. I have a friend, Ken, who's an architect in Baton Rouge. About 20 years ago, Ken realized that the company he was working for was making plans that were illegal. It involved a state contract. He went to his boss with his reservations. He was fired. Life was hard for a while, but Ken never regretted that decision. If I'm not mistaken, the story ends with the boss in question being indicted. I know a banker who turned down a promotion because it interfered with another call on his life. But he didn't. He knew he might lose his job. It turns out he didn't lose his job, but he was willing to. 
if it was necessary. So one of the things that needs to happen if we're going to serve God faithfully out in the world is we have to keep perspective. Our highest allegiance is to the creator of the universe over every other power. God gives us gifts for the sake of the church. But he gives gifts to us for the sake of the world as well. God gives us gifts, and then he gives us as a gift to the world, to our school systems, to our political systems, to our businesses, to our families. But it's not easy, and it's not automatic. So many Christians don't live up to this high calling because they haven't given sufficient attention to the very things we are learning from Daniel's life. There's a huge pressure in the world to conform. And if we don't have a sense of identity that's rooted in God, we'll just go with the flow. If we don't have integrity, a real commitment to the success and health of the community around us, if we don't have that commitment, people will never trust us. And so we never get an opportunity to make real change. If we don't build our skills, if we don't pursue excellence, it isn't long before people will quickly turn and look to others for help. Doing good in the world is going to be hard work. And if we're not willing to lose it all, fear will win in every hard decision. This is an important one. Being faithful to God in a world that doesn't care about God is going to bring risks. Sometimes you're going to be rejected. Sometimes your ideas and efforts are going to be pushed aside. But doesn't that sound familiar? That was Jesus' experience. This is what God experiences now in the world. And God is with us to strengthen us and protect us in that sort of environment. And it's at these moments that we learn God's heart. Because being rejected is not just something God does to change us and make us better. It's, it's something that he wants us to understand because that's what happens to him. And in those moments, we not only learn God's heart, but we learn that he can be trusted. And we experience his power inside of us. And this is his work in us, just as it was in Daniel's life. So, it doesn't all depend on you. You can invite God to be doing this in you. The man I mentioned earlier, Mike Arnold, he was gifted by God and he became a gift to the world. He was at the leadership summit because he took these things from Daniel's life seriously. He was there to improve the quality of his leadership. He was there to improve his capacity to understand his identity in God. By the way, this leadership summit comes every year in August and we have a satellite uh, center's for this all over Baltimore. I go every year and I invite you to take it seriously. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. But he was there in order to grow and to be responsible. And at that place, God gave him a grand vision. And out of that, he had to take a big risk. But God used that to bring millions, millions, of poor children, blessing. Some of the neediest children in the world. That same God, with personal attention, gives each of you gifts. And so you can be the next blessing to the world. Let's pray. God, we commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to your work in us. And Lord, we know we're not up to the task, so we invite you in, God. 
we invite you in to continue to work in us, to help us see your heart, to help us experience the heart of Jesus, to help us experience the power of Jesus, the fruits of the Spirit that will give us energy and guidance to treat people the way they should be, and then to use our gifts in ways that serve our community well and ultimately bring blessing any way you choose. For we ask it in Jesus' name.